And here we are, episode two of Future Forward. I'm Steve Rosenbaum. And, I'm uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, a, a couple of our friends said to us last week that we didn't, that we didn't properly introduce ourselves. So uh, I, I'll just start by saying I'm Steve Rosenbaum. I've done a bunch of companies and I'm interested in media technology uh, and how that impacts sociology and the world around us. Gene? I'm Gene DeRose. Uh, like Steve, we've known each other for 20 plus years, longtime entrepreneur, founder of Jupiter Communications, big research company that covered the internet and uh, investing in and advising companies ever since. So we're, we're going to talk, we have three chapters in the show today, but we're going to start with some quick cuts. Um, Gene, you want to you launch into our qu quick cut sequence? Sure. Yeah. So I think the idea we thought was uh, in addition to uh, a little semi in depth, five minutes each coverage each uh, each week on a uh, evolving uh, uh, today, tomorrow, you know, the future on topics that we would just do a drive by on a few things with our intended methodology of being future forward. So news, some things out there that we like, some things out there that we don't like. So uh, we'll start out because we covered it and we had some insight um, last week. Now that they've had the hearings, I guess um, maybe I'll let you start and, 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 and kind of, you know, put a few things out there, Steve, what you thought, given um, uh, you looked at and saw some early word uh, and we thought that, that things were going to be a bit shocking. So it's a little hard to say. I mean, you know, because there was that terrible terrorist act in New York, the news, you know, which will always follow the most kind of bright, shiny object, all shifted to terrorism, the attacks, survivors, which is what it should have done. I understand that. But but what was going on in Congress, A, it was three lawyers presenting. B, I'm not sure there was any bit of news that jumped off the page. And so it kind of got lost. Yeah, yeah. I think the shocking, I was just, I ended up being shocked, but it was because of the incongruity, incongruousness of the whole thing, the, the tone deafness of putting the lawyers up there, and then just the fact that they were talking around each other. It was just kind of absurd. And so the anger of a few people was deserved. And by the way, my intro to even this topic is too long, so we'll be, we'll be very sort of self-critical as we go. We wanted this to definitely be boom, boom, boom. But I like the way you uh, put that out there. So that's uh, that's enough for now. And we can cover it as we will a little bit later. So what I'd like to do, because um, we see things all the time now, is is let's play around with a, with a, with a, a little segment that is uh, uh, – thumbs up, thumbs down, kind of, but with a little depth. Uh, site or app or product you're liking right now, and then we'll do uh, things you're really hating right now. So um, do you want to start with something that you're really uh, liking right now, Steve? Yeah, that would be this guy right here. Oh, there it is. Uh, you know, um, you, you got to love Apple. Uh, they did it. Uh, it's a great device. It's... Um, it's thinner than the plus it's sexy it works the face detection stuff is like second nature in 20 minutes uh the missing home button i couldn't care less big big win right right wow that's great well we knew we debated whether we would go in depth and i think we thought we wanted to drive by on this but after you play with it for a week i think it'll be a good one to chew on next week but it sure sounds like the the early word is good with a little footnote of they're going to force us to pay a thousand dollars yeah what about you <laughs> yeah so um I, what i have been uh liking lately is i'm going to be a little uh well, well i'll put it this way i like where a couple of the news major news sites news presences are heading. And I guess in particular, I'd say, I know we're going to be talking about Amazon later on video, but um, the Washington Post, I just think things are starting to, uh, they're starting to get a grip on the medium, you know, large format. If you look at the Washington Post iPad app, it's it's beautiful and it's fun. And the combination of what they're doing with visibility and a, and a daringness to reposition themselves. And then I'll just throw in that the Times, um, 
I think has done an incredible job with uh, the six or eight months of moving to, to, to podcasts every day. It's, it's a really great touch and it's a, uh, it's a really uh, a cool thing. So we'll be spending a lot more time on that, but I, I just, those are some guys I like in particular. All right. Uh, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to go last on the hate category. Yeah, I was just going to say, I yeah. can launch right into it because yeah. I think you may have heard some of this from me uh, in some of our uh, talks leading up to this. I have got a real angst about ESPN right now. And I know Disney's suffering and the ratings are suffering and they must be making cuts and everything, but I'm a big sports fan. I have my wonkish places. I like things, but I'm also a generic enough and they are doing a terrible job. Their website is detailed and has a lot of stuff in it. But the minute you go to their mobile app, iPhone, iPad, it doesn't matter. The minute you try to deal with their bread and butter in the future, which should be their, their live streaming. You can't find it. They're not servicing it anymore. I'm really worried. It's like they don't care and they're willing to just suffer through the cuts when that's their future business. Yeah. So I've got one that's like bur burning a hole in the pit of my stomach. And it was funny because when you said earlier, hey, we should do what we like, what we don't like. I'm like, oh, I'm good on everything. I'm like, no, I'm actually not. Yeah. I am beyond pissed off at what happened to DNA Info and, uh, and Gothamist. I'm just, I think it's, it's just criminal. And I think that, you know, Ricketts decision to shut it down after they unionized, like it's the definition of union busting. And, and what I don't get, and here's the thing I don't get, I get that he's rich as Crotius and he doesn't care, but there's 115 journalists who he could have sold it, right? I mean, theoretically, now, maybe he tried to and he didn't get any buyers, but he didn't because I would have heard that. So yeah. he could have said, I'm stepping away. I need another buyer. Put it in the market. And then if it doesn't sell, then the market's spoken. But to shut it down when it's a going concern with traffic and like, I just think that's wrong. I, it doesn't make sense. There's got to be some little bit of untold story here. Or maybe they had tried more than it seemed like at first, but it sure seemed abrupt and sad. And I think these guys don't realize how loyal and passionate some of the people, even if the businesses are suffering, are in some of the things they're doing. So it all sucks. Right. All right. We're, we're, that, that's our little quick take segment. Let's get into segment one because we got we got three big segments on this week's show. And yep. uh, let's start with the uh, the YouTube Amazon video Battle of the Titans because. Boy, oh boy, you know, I just um, didn't see that one coming. Well, or maybe I did. Yeah, I mean, I don't, um, by the way, I'm not really seeing, uh, I'm just going to comment while we go. I'm not seeing the programmed screen up here. No. Or is that? No, nope, uh, that's okay. gone. We're just recording. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, I think that um, it's a bigger deal. I don't know. These th it's very hard to decide if these video uh, battles are Tempest in a teapot because there's a longer term you know, view here of, of, of what's happening. So I, I'd like to hear what you think is more really got you gritting your teeth about it, because I'm not sure I care that much. <laughs> All right. So so let me let me backtrack and tell everybody um, uh, listening and watching at home what happened. So um, Go Amazon has this device called Amazon Echo Show. It's a it's like the Amazon Echo, but it's got a great big screen on it. Big. I mean, the size of a paperback book. And it's a pretty little device and it's got kind of a chat feature. You can call your grandma on it. It's kind of nifty. Um, everyone that I know that has one has been using it with great joy in the kitchen and using it as a cookbook. Going onto YouTube, finding a recipe, listening to music, and at the same time watching a video and, and cooking using the Amazon uh, Echo Show. Uh, about six days ago, um, Google unceremoniously and without warning shuts off Amazon's access to YouTube. Amazon seems shocked by this. Uh, and Google says, well, you weren't living in the terms of our API. It's kind of a ham handed answer. Um, the, the gossip mill says that they've been talking about um, some kind of a royalty arrangement for uh, some time. Um, and they were unable to come to terms. Amazon wanted a piece of the ads that played. I don't even know exactly what happened, but it's clearly like the Battle of the Titans. But but for me, and why, why this matters to me, is so much of the web's video 
is now held by YouTube. Like such a large percentage of the web's particularly long tail video is held by YouTube that for Google to start to decide pejoratively who can have it and who can't, like it's kind of a big deal and yeah. it's kind of creepy. Yeah, well, I think it is. And ironically, the analogy is not direct, but it involves one of the parties. You know, it's sort of like the leverage that Amazon has been able to wield over book publishers. You know, they had such a dominant, you know, spot that they were basically forcing pricing and choice and, you know, uh, all these other issues. So I, I do think it is Amazon almost my point is Amazon probably has no right to really complain, but I do get that this is a real jousting and positioning. There's two big unknowns in this that are looming, one of which is, of course, Apple. Um, and the other is um, is is Facebook, I think, um, and some of the other giants to a lesser extent. But but uh, I, you know, it's really it goes back to it reminds me of the the um, the hearings, you know, suddenly calling. Are you a platform or are you a delivery channel? You know, YouTube has not. You know, they have a kind of a flat API, which is to say you can do millions and millions of things writing around them, but it's basically off of a basic feed of their basic service. So you can't do a lot of really nifty things. So that's always both surprised me. I don't know. It's just uh, it's hard to know what the where the next dire direction they would go with that. A lot of what um, Amazon and Apple go to with Siri and um, Alexa is is Google searches when all else fails. So maybe that's next. You know, you know, one of the things I think we ought to say out loud just to ring a little bit of an alarm bell here is what you're seeing is, you know, the 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 real battle of clo closed web versus open web. Yep. And, you know, if at the end of the day, your living room is going to have one owner and it's either going to be Apple or it's going to be Google or it's going to be Amazon and they are going to use that ownership of your living room with with great you know, kind of competitive advantage and no sense of openness. You know, you know, one of the things that the rumor mill said about why Google pulled its videos off of Amazon Echo, you know, Echo Show is they're going to build their own Google Home Show and they want those videos to be one of the special things you get if you have the Google Home device as opposed to the Amazon Echo device. And I'm like, I just don't like it makes me feel icky that they're like willing to kind of battle yeah. over my entire engagement. Yeah, yeah and, and honestly, you know what it is? It's 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 you would think that that the future version of the home, the evolving future version of the home is is open in the sense that everything's networked together. Everything's kind of, um, you know, uh, Internet anchored and APIs. Um, and what we're not going to do is redo the same problem that slowed down television for 30 or 40 years, right? That's a closed system. You only go through your carrier and the TV set top, and it's still an issue that's basically about to start to explode even more with all the Netflixes and everyone else in the world. But it's the same kind of thing. But the minute it's about home control, you know, the Nest acquisitions and other kind of things are stepping into the, the fray here. So it's hard to, um, I have a little gripe about Sonos, honestly, on this. And I know we can move on to the next topic, but it's a similar kind of thing. You know, it's it's a wonderful capability, but it's not open enough, but I don't blame them. <laughs> uh, you know, I, honestly, if I were the Sonos CEO, I don't think I'd be getting a night's sleep for the last six months. Oh, so. no. well, you know why? It's like it's 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 we used to talk about being Amazon when you would be displaced. And, and the new thing, if you have a, an early start on a technology area is like you'd get TiVo'd, right? Blazing a trail and just getting dusted because, you know, they had no leverage and they didn't uh, have enough love from people. <laughs> All right. Se segment number two. Uh, segment number two, near and dear to my heart, we are in fact going to try and wrap our arms around fake news. Yep. Yep. Now, let me start by telling a little bit of a story. So, um, when I joined the TED residency, uh, applied in November of last year and started in February, my my TED talk, my my research project uh, there for three and a half four months was on fake news and. I talked to 50 people, had amazing conversations, learned a lot, understood the complexity in ways I hadn't before, and then had to boil that learning, that big, massive, horny problem down into six minutes. 
which was the TED residency talk length. There were 23 of us. We all had six minute talks. Um, it was so hard. It was so painful. It was so um, difficult. A and it was difficult because it's not a little issue, right? It's a big issue. And, and you want to say something that's relevant and thoughtful and timely and actionable, but not just pablum like, you know, hey, right. fake news is bad. Yeah. Well, look, your talk was great, though, and I don't know, it, it, you know, in a perfect world, we could give a little couple of clips from it, because I, I really think that you you did a good job of being really big picture and cobbling all that together, but have being hard hitting with totally tantalizing thesis. I think you should uh, let's share look, it so we can, you know, yeah, let's I'll, I'll play a clip now. I've got, I've got it queued up. So let's, let's pay Let's play a clip. Here we go. television now my guess is that many of you are streaming live on Facebook right now and finally print used to require printing presses and physical devices but now it lives in the sky above us in the cloud so what's changed today the tools are democratized consumers are makers and information is abundant so these are all good things right well the answer is sort of because anything that we can't seem to find context around we simply label as fake. So, so we'll stop there. I mean, the, the, the thing I tried to say is we've been going down this track for a very long time, and all of us in technology have kind of patted ourselves on the back going, man, we're, we're building the future. Like, everyone's going to get access to tools. We're all going to have a TV camera in our pockets. We're all, and that is going to make the world a more connected, more human, more democratic more intellectually stimulating place. Or maybe it turns out we got that all wrong. Well, right. And your premise, you know, I mean, I, I feel like you're bearing the lead a little bit. The idea that there's no such thing anymore, which was kind of your, you know, coded to the whole thing. I mean, it just explain, you, you didn't show that part of the clip, but explain what you mean by that, because I, I'd like to comment a little behind it. But, but that there's no such thing as uh, that all news is fake news. There's no such thing as truth. There's no such thing as. I mean, the, the, you know, basically, you know, in a world of infinite voices and infinite sources, the idea that there's black and white and that there's absolute truth and there's absolute fake gets lost in. Well, you know, I mean, in a sense, it's what's come out of this White House, which is, you know, well, you know, you know, you know, you have your truth and we have our truth. Right. Um, and, and why I think that's a good thing, and this has made some people in my community yes. fairly angry at me, is like, yeah, you know, it's really great when you can go to your neighborhood restaurant and say to the waiter who knows you, listen, just, you, know what I, you know what I like, just deliver to me the, the, my favorite meal and a glass of wine. And when the when menu gets too big and too noisy, it's like, oh man, I gotta actually like, think about these things. I got to, you know, decide who I want to listen to. And, you know, I got to read by, beyond the headlines. But, but to me, it's like we're now in an era, and I call it awake news, where people have to take responsibility right. for what they read. Right. And, awake news, I think, is a keep going. <laughs> no, you know, and somebody said, well, you mean news literacy? It's like, no, I don't mean news literacy. I mean something right. very different. News literacy is a is a middle school, you know, it comes after health class and, you know, before the PE. Awake News says, you know, we're, you know, yes, I trust the New York Times, but I read everything with a certain amount of cynicism and I read the op-ed page differently than I read the news page. And, and I don't just kind of accept it wholeheartedly and without, without engagement. Right. Yeah, no, I think that, I think you're right. I think, some of this becomes semantic in the sense that um, what used to be news or media literacy uh, and never was sufficiently curriculumized, even though, yes, we know the tropes of recognize when something is advertising and all that stuff. But there isn't a new version of that. And it's really terrible. And so some of what you're talking about, which I think is intuitively being woke, and present and 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 aware enough to know what's going on you know i think a lot of people don't know don't see those cues so i you know to me 
transparency is so key, which can mean so many different things. But I do think there should be a certain requirement to show a little bit like what they said in the hearings where who bought your ads, but it's more than just that. It's it's what is the you know origin of how something came to me. Um, I believe you cannot decide whether you know global warming is 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 man made or not in in a, in a if it were, if that was new information. And so those are difficult ones. I think authority of who is telling you something is really important. But other than that, it's educating people. And I, and I, you know, but I don't like the idea of giving up on the idea of objective truths when there's a difference between judgment calls and facts. But Look, I don't know what the answer is. Well, I mean, I mean, in some ways, I think the, the first thing you have to do is like the idea that we're, you know, that we're just going to rail at the platforms and say, you know, why didn't they tell us? I mean, I, I actually think Facebook's been remarkably honest about this. I think I think they've I think they were as surprised at how out of control the, the some users of their platform were. I don't think they right. knew. Right, right. And by the way, just as an interjection, I will refuse to call them platforms because that is a fabrication of their own and a very recent one, which is narrowly about putting themselves in a in a legal and defensible uh, uh, PR position. It's like we run the printing presses, you know, yeah. you know, I'm going to call these guys what they are. Facebook's a social network that now, has, you know, uh, uh, Google is in many, you know, tethered, <laughs> whatever. Twitter is a social network slash, you know, a uh, personal publishing platform. But anyway, it's just a hang up I have. No, no, no. Look, by the way, I, I all, all I'll say is this. If they think that being called a platform means that they're going to be able to hide in, you know, in, in safe harbor, that's not going to happen. Right, I mean, right, exactly. Um, anyway, this is such a great topic, and we're going to be ongoing with it. So I'll give you a chance to move us to the next one, though. So, so the next one is is the future, and it's it's you know it's big and 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 and, and kind of hairy in its own right, um, and, and it's one that I've you know been thinking about a lot, and it's you know what when we talk about driverless cars, like. First of all, I here's here's my naive thing. I thought, going back five years, eight years, driverless cars technology is going to start to work. There's going to be all kinds of speed bumps to slow it down. The government's not going to like it because who, insurance companies aren't going to like it. Uh, you know, um, Detroit's not going to like it. Like like, it's there's a million reasons for people to throw sand in the gears. And, and I'm dumbfounded in a good way, but dumbfounded that none of that has really slowed it down. Like insurance companies seem to have figured out a way that, I don't know how it's gonna work when one driverless car hits another driverless car. Is it just gonna be no fault? Everyone, you know, you know, I, but, yeah. but, 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 but there's a terrific article in Futurism and this is what made me wanna talk with you about it today. Right. And it, it did such a good job of drawing a picture of the future in which parking lots are become public spaces with streets become walkable like the fundamental changes in what cities will look like like if you really think about the world the idea that there's the, the cement ribbon that runs through the planet and we all drive on it is a relatively recent occurrence that's right that's right and yeah. and futurism imagines a bunch of that going away yeah. I mean, this is a this is an exciting topic because it is such a futurist bit of subject matter where we can see the inevitable future. We can see the five years ahead, um, uh, quantum leak changes or improvements. And there is so much and it is so uh, filled with signal to noise issue for consumers because because we don't see the amount of money to be saved or made or the opportunities when things are massively scaled that will lead some of these changes to happen so fast, right? The things that, you know, this is like um, Erie Canal level stuff, right? Changes the entire future of transportation, opens up the world. There are things that are, you know, so all the blocking and tackling in the near term, it's, it's crazy because all we think of is how could it possibly be safe anytime soon, right? It just can't be. But our minds socially are just completely wrapped up in that and the danger and the accidents. But the minute I saw, I think, was it um, 
a couple of different cities now are, are working on driverless, you know, uh, the tunnels that'll go underground where you just put your cars on it and boom, you know, you go 200 miles an hour. I forget what those are called, but um, it's it's, that, it's Elon Musk's company and he calls it with appropriate irony, the boring company. Oh, right. Yeah, right, right, exactly. But he has, you know, there's two different uh, one mile stretches in different city right. uh, areas where they're testing parts of it. But that feels like a no brainer to me. And it also wakes you up to how different something can be, because that sure seems like let's have channels everywhere. Right? right. But like put them on a 200 mile an hour uh, jetty. Now, 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 let's just get to the dark part, because this is the part that has me up at night, which is like when you look at the number of people that make their living driving vehicles, truck drivers, delivery drivers, Uber drivers, you know, ambulance drivers, the list goes on and on and on. And you realize that everybody whose basic economic livelihood is based on sitting behind the wheel and moving a vehicle around, like these, these people are not gonna have jobs. Yeah, no, this is a big issue. And I think about this the way I do with kind of both original information worker transitions, um, and the closing of auto plants and things like this. And, you know, I'm, I'm, as, I'm as progressive and liberal as anyone, but it is a classic area where if you look at this from a tech and an inevitability and the improvement of lives and efficiency, there's nothing I would say to slow that down for those poor people that might lose their jobs. It's more a question of what should the transition look like? How do you retrain populations? How do you get people to be part of this because it isn't about protecting those jobs it, it can't be I mean, if it is it's going to be you know uh partisan politics nonsense in the near term so i, mean, I feel sorry for them but but it is also something that um you know there are many many ways i mean let's face it uber has expanded in a way the employment opportunities and diversified the things you could do um and I guess that's probably short term relative to the big picture of um, losing truck drivers. But but, 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 but I'm going to push back on, on something you said, because I think it's it's really easy to just say sitting in our comfy homes, you know, retrain them. But like if you like seriously, if you're a 54 year old truck driver, what are you going to be retrained to do? Like you're uh, not look, you're not going to yeah. make microchips. Yeah. And I shouldn't I don't mean to speak lightly of it because I don't. When I say retrain, I mean, I'm not sure of the answer to that one or what the right way to do it is, but I do feel like um, these are these are longer, more general, slow moving versions of the absurdity of trying to protect co-worker jobs right now. You know, I mean, it's just sad. I mean, but what do you do? You have to figure out how to manage through it. So so by the way, that's a that's a great place to leave this on. If, if you actually think that the trajectory of employment for dri drivers of vehicles is is on the same similar trajectory as coal workers i mean well no be, <laughs> I, I didn't mean, say that well no 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 no, no. I, i'm putting so words we, in your mouth on purpose because right, that's a right. good headline and i'll steal it yeah, yeah. and there's <laughs> inevitability behind these things that you know like i'm not on the libertarian side you know of tech and we can tee this one up for the future because maybe the 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 peeves thing could also have to do with uh yeah. <laughs> people or startups but i i, I i'm you know I'm not a libertarian in that sense at all, so uh, don't don't take me at that one. That's the, the way, West. Here, here's tech. the here's the one that I, that has me scratching my head. So you've got a driverless car driving down the street, and um, and a, a senior citizen steps out in front of the vehicle. The vehicle it's too close to stop. They're going to have to swerve to not hit this senior citizen. And there on the sidewalk is a kindergarten class. You have to have computer programming in that device that's making moral decisions about who the vehicle's gonna injure. Like that's real, like that's really chilling. Uh, I completely agree. I, I don't, I don't understand how that's gonna be possible anytime soon. That's why I leaped over to the, to the boring version. <laughs> well, but, 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 here, but here's the answer, you know, not that I think this is a good thing, but you know, I mean, insurance companies, you know, have actuarial tables right now that tell you, you know, they, they can calculate if you, God forbid, were killed in a car accident, you know, they can calculate your age and your income and your lifespan. They have a they, have, they already have existing actuarial tables to say 
you know, what the balance of your life would be worth in an insurance settlement. Now it's gruesome stuff, but that, you know, those, those tables could be in a sense, and I assume they are already being looked at as part of, you know, who's, you know, what, how the, how the algorithm decides, you know, you know, to make a judgment about, you know, a dog versus a person. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, just one footnote. And I know we're, we're wrapping up, but, but I don't think we can forget in the world of driverless automotive and all that other stuff, how the sort of the Trojan horse that affects all of that stuff are um, electric cars and just bringing tech to cars in general. And so, you know, Tesla and the like, you know, this is less just about this pure industrial issue of transitioning automotive to being driverless as much as it is um, who's going to have the leverage to, to make the decisions and, and what will driverless riding be riding on, as it were. And I think it's going to be electric and, and low energy vehicles uh, uh, as a leader. We are out of time. Uh, listeners, viewers, we would love to hear from you. Uh, tweet us at hashtag futureforward.com or um, I'm at Magnify Media. Gene, what's your Twitter? I'm address? at I'm at Gene DeRose, and since he won't say it because he's humble, you know our middle section. Do go look at the wonderful five six minute talk that Steve gave at as TED Talks because uh, he was very succinct, uh, and it's a pretty powerful little uh, piece. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent uh, show. Uh, high five. See you high next five. week. Yep. So long. Bye, Steve. Bye.